Well, in your bulletins, you'll find an outline this morning on the passage that I'll be preaching on, but you'll note that the date on it says Wednesday, and I think it's from back in January of 2015 or February, I forget exactly when, but I I put that in there on purpose because uh, on Wednesday nights, we have a Bible study as well as a prayer time, and it's usually a, a good time of not only studying the Word, but of discussing the Word together. It's more like a Sunday school class type of atmosphere. And, and so there's, a, there's a, a lot of discussion that can take part or take place during that particular class and so, or class or, or time on Wednesday nights. So I'd like to encourage you, if you've never been on a Wednesday night, to consider coming. It's an important time. I believe that prayer is one of the most important things we can do as believers in accomplishing the will of God because God can do what you and I cannot do. And so when we go to Him in prayer, we are able to ask Him to do that, which only He alone can do. And when we do it together, we do it corporately. And I believe that there's power in that. And the Bible, of course, encourages that and sets the precedent and sets the example for that. So I'd like to encourage you to consider coming out on Wednesday nights for that time. This morning's message, for those of you that come on Wednesday nights, you may think, well, Pastor Dean, if you would have told me this in advance, I would have skipped out on this morning. So, uh, it's not, not the same exact uh, message. In fact, it's quite different, although uh, the outline is the outline that I'll be following. So Leviticus chapter 11, as we look at this chapter, I want you to consider what does beef or what does food have to do with holiness. What does food have to do with holiness? Let's read Leviticus chapter 11. I'd like to read the whole chapter, so follow along as I try to read through it quickly. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, say to the Israelites of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones you may eat. You may eat any animal that has a split hoof, completely divided, and that chews the cud. There are some that only chew the cud or only have a split hoof. But you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is ceremonially unclean for you. The coney, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean. Uh, By the way, they believe the coney is probably something like a rock badger, something of that nature. Hyrax or a rock badger. The coney, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean for you. And the pig, though it has a split hoof, completely divided, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcass. They are unclean for you. Of all the creatures living in the water of the seas and the streams, you may eat any that have fins and scales. But all creatures in the seas or streams that do not have fins and scales, whether among all the swarming things or among all the other living creatures in the water, you are to detest. And since you are to detest them, you must not eat their meat, and you must detest their carcasses. Anything living in the water that does not have fins and scales is to be detestable to you. These are the birds you are to detest and not eat, because they are detestable. The eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, the red kite, and any uh, black kite, and any kind of raven, the horned owl, the screech owl, the gull, any kind of hawk, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the stork, any kind of heron, uh, the hopo, hopi, and the bat. Now, a bat's not a bird, we know that, but it's a flying animal. All flying insects that walk on all fours are to, de- to be detestable to you. Uh, there are, however, some winged creatures that walk on all fours that you may eat, those that have jointed legs for hopping on the ground. Of these, you may eat any kind of locust, katydid, cricket, or grasshopper. But all other winged creatures that have four legs you are to detest. You will make yourselves unclean by these. Whoever touches their carcasses will be unclean till evening. Whoever picks up one of their carcasses must wash his clothes, and he will be unclean till evening. Every animal that has a split hoof, not completely divided, or that does not chew the cud, is unclean for you. Whoever touches their carcasses or the carcasses of any of them will be unclean. Of all the animals that walk on all fours, those that walk on their paws, like a dog, for example, or a cat, are unclean for you. Whoever touches their carcasses will be unclean till evening. Anyone who picks up their carcasses must wash his clothes, and he will be unclean till evening. They are unclean for you. Of the animals that move about on the ground, they are, they are 
<clears throat> these are unclean for you. The weasel, the rat, any kind of great lizard, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the wall lizard, the skink, and the chameleon. All of these that move along the ground, these are unclean for you. Whoever touches them when they are dead will be unclean till evening. When one of them dies and falls on something, that article, whatever its use, will be unclean, whether it is made of wool, cloth, hide, or sackcloth. Put it in water, it will be unclean till evening, and then it will be clean. If one of them falls into a clay pot, everything in it will be unclean, and you must break the pot. Any food that could be eaten but has water on it from such a pot is unclean, and any liquid that could be drunk from it is unclean. Anything that one of their carcasses falls on becomes unclean. An oven or a cooking pot must be broken up. They are unclean, and you are to regard them as unclean. A spring, however, or a cistern for collecting water remains clean, but anyone who touches one of these carcasses is unclean. If a carcass falls on any seeds that are to be planted, they remain clean. But if the water has been put on the seed and a carcass falls on it, it is unclean for you. If an animal that you are allowed to eat dies, anyone who touches the carcass will be unclean till evening. Anyone who eats some of the carcass must wash his clothes, and he will be unclean till evening. Anyone who picks up the carcass must wash his clothes, and he will be unclean till evening. Every creature that moves about around on the ground is detestable. It is not to be eaten. You are not to eat any creature that moves around on the ground, whether it moves on its belly, like a snake, or walks on all fours, or on many feet. It is detestable. Do not defile yourself by any of these creatures. Do not make yourselves unclean by means of them, or be made unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy, because I am holy. These are the regulations concerning animals, birds, every living thing that moves in the water, and every creature that moves about on the ground. You must distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. Let's pray. Father, we realize as we study this passage that we're dealing with a text that uh, was written to a people group a long, long time ago, and that oftentimes is debated as to why it was written. So I pray that you'd give us insight this morning as we study it, insight not only into what you're saying to the people of Israel, but how it applies to us today. We realize that you've given us your Holy Spirit and and so we have the very author of Scripture indwelling us and enabling us to understand the things of God, the Word of God, which is impossible for those who don't know you. And so, Father, enlighten our eyes and our minds and help us to understand these things this morning. And again, just as importantly, help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to be holy because you are holy. In Jesus' name, amen. After the flood, when God entered into a covenant with Noah and his sons, he allowed them to eat flesh. Prior to this, we believe that they were primarily vegetarians. So after the flood, things began to change, and yet there was still a distinction that was made between the clean and the unclean, because you remember, as Noah um, was to gather, and really he didn't gather, he just allowed them on, God brought the animals to him, uh, he was to distinguish between clean and unclean animals at that time. And so they were to take two of every uh, kind of unclean animal and seven of every kind of clean animal. And so some sort of distinction, although the Scripture never really defines what was clean and unclean prior to that, we're, we're assuming that it's probably very similar to the descriptions we've read here. A and that clean and unclean primarily prior to the flood and immediately after the flood, but prior to the giving of the law, which took some place some 500 years or more after, well, actually 2,000, probably 2,000 years, I'm thinking Abraham, uh, it's about maybe 2,000 years after, uh, after the flood. Let's see, uh, yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, <coughs> so uh, afterwards, the, the primary distinction of clean and unclean had to do with sacrifices rather than what they ate or did not eat. Okay, so clean and unclean prior to the Mosaic law, which was given uh, by God to Moses somewhere around, and people debate the date, but somewhere around 1500 B.C. Prior to that, clean and unclean primarily had to do with sacrifices. We don't 
we don't see any real dietary restrictions given. In fact, the dietary restrictions were given specifically to the nation of Israel, which has application to what we're going to talk about later as well. And so when we come to this passage in Leviticus, a part of the law given to Moses, we find God further distinguishing between clean and unclean, detailing those animals, defining those animals that were considered clean and those that were considered unclean, and now we find that, they, they, that we have dietary restrictions or that Israel had dietary restrictions attached to the clean and the unclean. And so it didn't have to do just with sacrifices anymore, although all of the sacrifices fit into the, the, the category of clean animals. There were no unclean animals that could be sacrificed. All sacrifices fit into the category, so they may, we may say that they're sort of a subcategory of clean animals. And so we find here the, the definitions then of what is clean and what is unclean, and, and, and in particular to what they could eat, not just what they could sacrifice. And so first of all, we find uh, some definitions regarding land animals. And by the way, this passage is not completely comprehensive on the laws regarding dietary restrictions for the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 14 gives us uh, some more details, but not, not, not in the, in the uh, general broad categories, but in the specifics. For example, you could take s simply the, the, the broad definitions of what type of animals are clean and unclean in relationship to whether it's a land mammal or whether it's a bird or whether it's a, what we might call a fish or a sea creature, and, and you could deduce from those broad category definitions what you could eat and what you couldn't eat. By, let me give you an example of that. For land animals or land mammals, it gives us two requirements for them to be clean. One is that they must have a completely divided hoof or what we would call a cloven hoof. A cow is a good example of that. But it must not only have a cloven hoof, it also must chew the cud. That's where an animal regurgitates its food, swallows it, regurgitates it, swallows it. You've done that sometimes when you're not feeling well probably, right? <laughs> well, you may not chew it the second time around, but we've all had it happen, haven't we? <laughs> it's nasty for us, but for some of these animals, it's perfectly natural. And so... Those were the two requirements. Now from that, whether you have a comprehensive list of animals here given or not, you can examine the animal if you had any questions and you were living in this day and you were part of ancient Israel. You could simply examine the animal and ask these two questions. Does it have a completely, completely divided hoof, a cloven hoof, and does it chew the cud? And it must do both in order for it to be clean, in order for you as an ancient Israelite to eat it. Now, there are some animals that are specifically named as being prohibited here. And, and, and in Deuteronomy 14, there are some animals that are specifically named as being allowed. For example, in Deuteronomy 14, it says you can eat the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe, the deer, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. And there are probably some other mammals today that are simply maybe uh, variations of those animals um, that have maybe taken place over uh, in re as a result of breeding, whether domestic breeding, right? Uh, we have all sorts of varieties of cows today that they probably didn't have at that time. They probably simply had something like wild buffalo or wild cows of some sort that exist. But today, farmers have bred out certain characteristics and bred in certain characteristics, but they would all have the cloven hoof and chew the cud, and so they'd be okay to eat. And, and so we find... Uh, by looking at the broad category requirements that we can deduce from that, then what would be allowed and what wouldn't be allowed. So for land animals, it's chewing the cud and having a cloven hoof. For marine animals, again, fairly simple. It must have fins, and not only have fins, it must have scales. If it doesn't have fins and scales, you can't eat it. Sorry, shrimp lovers. Right? Wow, some of that food that I so like and so enjoy. Now, we'll see later on that this doesn't apply to us and never has. That's the mistake that some people make. Although there are still Christians, certain sects of Christianity, even some denominations that try to make these dietary restrictions a part of the Christian's life. Uh, they would teach that they are almost, in a sense, binding on the Christian. That in, or in order to be fully obedient to God, you must follow these dietary restrictions. Well, unless you're Jewish, I can tell you right now, they never, never, ever applied to you unless you voluntarily, as a Gentile, wanted to follow them. We'll see that as we go on. Because these were 
regulations given specifically to the nation of Israel. So for marine animals, it had to have fins and scales. That means what? Scallops? No scallops? Oh, man. No oysters? That's okay with me. I don't mind. No oysters. That's fine. You know? Uh, but you could eat, what? Could you eat shark? No, you could not eat shark because al although um, it has fins, it doesn't have scales. And so, yeah, you can, you can then think about all your favorite foods that maybe you could eat or, or couldn't eat if you were Jewish living at this particular time. Then for flying animals, for flying animals. Now, I said flying animals instead of birds because although some versions of the Bible may say birds, we recognize that bats are not birds. Bats are mammals. They're basically mice with wings, right? <laughs> so so uh, we, I just say we use the category flying animals. By the way, when you read through passages like this and you see things that don't seem to be completely scientifically accurate, realize that the Bible uses, just like you and I use today, it uses what we call phenomenal language. Phenomenal language. Now that doesn't mean, wow, it's fabulous, it's phenomenal. What it means is that they use language that described ordinary events in ordinary terms rather than giving the exact scientific reason or explanation for it. For uh, the, the most common example of that, and I think one of the best examples of that, is how they would have used it and how we use it today. We still use phenomenal language is that when you go to the beach here at Hudson or, with, or maybe somewhere else and you watch the sunset, you say to somebody, what a beautiful sunset. You don't say, what a beautiful earth turn. Right? Now we all realize the sun does not set. Gary does. Okay, Fran's pointing at Gary and says he, that he wants to be completely accurate. Um, so <laughs> you may want to take Gary's Sunday school class if you are not in a Sunday school class because he is always precise. I like that about him. Very precise. Sometimes I sit in there and I think, oh man, and Gary's probably thinking my sermon, I blew it on something. <laughs> yeah. Because he's... It's <laughs> As he's very precise. <laughs> but uh, we, we use ph phenomenal language today. We say, what a, uh, what a beautiful sunrise. And yet the sun isn't rising. The earth is turning. And we all know that. But you know what? Today, none of us mind that we use phenomenal language. But it's interesting that critics of the Bible attack the Bible on that basis. And they say, well, if the Bible's really inspired of God, didn't God know there was no such thing as sunsets and sunrises? And so why does the Bible say sunset and sunrise? For the same reason you and I say it today. We explain it in human terms as we see it as humans, even if we know better. And so the Bible uses phenomenal language. And so if your version says birds or something like that, at, at times people might say, hey, look at all, all, of all the birds. Or they might simply use gross generalizations for something or, or larger categories than are scientifically accurate. And, and so it doesn't undermine the inspiration of the Bible when bats are included in this, in this section. Uh, bats are flying, flying animals. And, and so... And some versions actually translate it that way, probably a little more correctly than others. There are, there are several birds that are prohibited in this category. Basically, basically, again, a general rule that would help you to distinguish what would be clean and unclean is if it's predatory, it's, it would be prohibited. And so birds like uh, um, a hawk or an eagle, some of those birds that we like the most, right? And here it says they're detestable to you. And, and I say, well, an eagle's not detestable. An eagle's beautiful. I remember going to Alaska with my wife uh, on a cruise there, and we did a land tour afterwards, and we were, we were at some place where there were all these bald eagles nesting, and these magnificent birds, right? They're not detestable. Why, why would it call it detestable? Well, it was to be detestable to them in relationship to their diet. Not that the bird had no grandeur or glory. They're all the creatures of God, and they all have their own glory. And in fact, all flesh has some sort of glory as being created objects of God. But, but it was detestable in the sense that they weren't to eat of it. They were to treat it that way in relationship to their diet. Then it talks about insects. And it, it, again, really, this category is very easy to distinguish what, what you could eat because there were basically only four uh, types of insects that you could eat, and they were all related in the sense that they had uh, jointed legs. Now it says, and they walk on all fours, and I realize grasshoppers have six legs. And yet grasshoppers are included in the list that you can eat. And yet grasshoppers oftentimes seem to be walking primarily on four legs. And so oftentimes the front two legs are used for other purposes. And so it may just be that the, you know, again, using phenomenal language or generalizations are allowed in, in Scripture. 
but they do have a jointed legs. So you, if, you, if you have the desire, you can eat a locust, a katydid, or a cricket, or a grasshopper. I would just encourage you to pull the legs off because on many of those, they have these little hooks that enable them to attach themselves to plants and stay there, and those hooks get caught in your throat sometimes when you eat those insects. It's better to pull the legs off of them prior uh, to eating them. And there are a lot of people in the world, and they're not that bad. <laughs> you, can't eat, you can't eat ants. You can't eat worms. I have eaten worms before. Um, as a little kid, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, my mom caught me doing it. She can tell you the story better than I can. And, and I survived. So it's not, it's not that these animals would, would kill the ancient Israelites if they ate them. The uh, question is, are, they, are, is, are these dietary restrictions uh, more healthy for you or less healthy, or do they have anything to do with health at all? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute as well. But they, they were simply a list of prohibited, prohibited foods. Then there's animals with paws. That would include monkeys. May, well, not monkeys. Um, yeah, maybe. I don't know what they would consider a monkey. Uh, dogs, though. Dogs walk on paws. Cats walk on paws. Other animals walk on paws. They would be prohibited. There are people, groups in the world today, that eat animals with paws, uh, dogs and cats. In fact, here in the United States, if you ever eat at a Chinese restaurant, you've <laughs> probably had some. <laughs> hey, I love Chinese food. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I, I eat Chinese food all the time. I love Chinese food. That's just a joke if you're an animal lover. But there are people in parts of the world, right? There are people in parts. If you go to South Korea, I have two nephews that were stationed in South Korea. They're both in the Air Force, Brian's boys. And uh, both of them have eaten dog. And they actually say it's quite tasty. The way it's prepared, um, it's quite tasty. And, uh, and so uh, I, you say, well, they're not supposed to do that. And we have some sort of aversion to that. Maybe it's because they're pets here. But we, we just think, oh, I would never eat a dog. I would never eat a dog. They're hairy animals. Well, you know, cows have hair, right? But we eat cows. It's mainly a cultural thing. We, we don't like to admit that, but it's primarily a cultural thing. If you were raised in South Korea, if you grew up there in a South Korean family, you would eat dog and you wouldn't think anything of it either. And you say, well, isn't that, it's prohibited. The Bible says not to. Again, and we'll see this in a minute. This, this is a list of dietary restrictions that applied to the nation of Israel and to the nation of Israel only. Then there are rodents and reptiles, those animals that crawl on the ground or on their belly. And, and prohibition, and basically all of those pretty much are prohibited. Then we find in, later on in the chapter, we looked at and, and read through very quickly some rules regarding contact with dead animals. And the bottom line is, is if, if you touch an animal, ev even if it dies of natural, well, specifically if it dies of natural causes, if you didn't kill it for food purposes, uh, even a clean animal, even a clean animal, if your cow died in the field and you touched it, you were unclean till evening. If, if you found a deer on the side of the road and it had died of natural causes, then it, well, you wouldn't find it. On, it really had roads back then. It might have been dirt roads, but you wouldn't be driving in your car and throwing it in the back of your pickup truck or something like that. It, but if it died of natural causes, you couldn't touch it. You would be unclean uh, till evening. And then if you have some of the rodents or reptiles that are described here, if they die and fall into, for example, a, a, let's say you have a clay pot. Everything was pretty much, all the pottery in those days was clay. They did have some brass and metal things, but for the most part, everybody used clay pots. That was the common material for making vessels of that day. In fact, when I was in Israel, I brought back, I have in my closet a whole bunch of pot shards, uh, broken pieces of pottery from all over Israel. And there's so much of it at these tells, at these mounds, these archaeological mounds. There are, there are so many. They don't even care if you take them anymore. They have all the broken pieces of pottery they want. Take all you want, help clean up Israel, go over, take a trip there, and bring back some pottery. And, and so everything's clay. Everything's clay. And, and what it says here is if something falls on a clay vessel, you're to break it. If something falls into the clay, you're to break it. Um, if there's water and it falls into it, you can't drink the water and you break the vessel. And, and so it gives you rules and regulations. And again, we think to ourselves, well, hey, maybe this has to do, even as you read it, they're not eating these things. They might drink the water or something, but if you've got an empty clay pot and something falls into it and it's dead, uh, you don't want to eat out of that anyways because something dead fell in it. And so that makes sense. Maybe this really is for health reasons. In fact, that's what I'd like to talk about now is what is the main purpose of these regulations? We've read all of these regulations. Some of them seem somewhat foreign to us, but what's the, the, the reason for them? 
Well, there are two primary, actually there's about six reasons that theologians discuss, but I think only two of them are, 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 are um, in, in my mind, plausible reasons for why we have what we have here, and the two most common ones. The first one is that the laws were given for basically sanitary and dietary purposes, for health reasons, for health reasons. And the passages that they would use, although this specific passage doesn't say, if you do this, you will be healthier, or if you don't do this, you won't be healthy, there are some general promises and curses given at the end of the covenants and in various places throughout the law that do talk about health in relationship to being obedient to the commands of God. For example, in Exodus, and you may want to write this down somewhere on the margins or on that outline, Exodus chapter 15, verses 25 through 26. It says, there the law, or the Lord, the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. He said, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So here God says, if you're careful to listen to all of my decrees and all of my commands and you obey them, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. And so people say, well, hey, hey, maybe some of these commands, these prohibitions, or, or some of the animals that are allowed, maybe, maybe these fit into this reasoning that they're given for health reasons, these laws. Deuteronomy chapter 7 says something similar. Deuteronomy 7, verses 12 through 15. God says, if you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the crops of your land, your grain and new wine. Now realize that we're talking about all the laws that God gave, not just these. 622 different laws to the nation of Israel. Not just the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a part of 622 laws that God gave to the nation of Israel. When people tell me, well, I'll ask them, why do you think you're going to heaven when you die? The most common response I get is because I'm a pretty good person. I try to obey the Ten Commandments, etc. Why just ten? What about the other 612? What? And so many people are unaware of the fact. God gave 622 different laws to the nation of Israel, not just ten. So he goes, he will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, your new wine and oil, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks in the land and he swore that, he swore to give the give, that he swore to your forefathers to give to you. You will be blessed more than any other people. None of your men or women will be childless nor any of your livestock without young. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt but he will, inflict on them, uh, he will inflict them on all who hate you. And then again in Deuteronomy 28, verse 22, it says, well, starting with verse 15, However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land that you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation and scorching heat and drought, with blight and mildew, which will plague you until you perish. And so again, it seems like there may be some very practical reasons for these. Maybe, maybe the obedience in relationship to these laws would cause these end results that if I eat correctly, I will avoid some diseases. If I do what God says, his blessings will be on me instead of his curses. And, and we won't experience the drought. We won't experience the blight. We won't experience the mildew. We won't be defeated by our enemies. Our wombs, the wombs of our women will be blessed and we'll, we'll be victorious over our enemies, etc., etc., etc. And so the, 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 the blanket blessings and cursings that are interdispersed among the various rules and regulations given to the nation of Israel seem to relate to those rules. And so I, I think there is some, uh, some logic in, in deducing that there is a, maybe a distinct possibility that some of these dietary restrictions, these dietary prohibitions, may lend themselves to healthy living. May. And the reason for that is, is that when we look at science today, uh, they haven't found any conclusive proof that following these kind of dietary restrictions adds to one's lifespan or to freedom from illness. 
Now, I don't know that there's ever been a comprehensive study on Orthodox Jews who eat only kosher foods. These, this would be your kosher. If you want a, a list of kosher foods, here you have it, right? Now, you don't have the seal on it. If you buy kosher foods today, in order for it to be kosher, it's supposed to say kosher on it. It's supposed to have a, a seal. And there are some health benefits to eating kosher foods in the sense that those manufacturers, those processors who, who make foods that you buy, if they are to put a seal on it saying that it's kosher, are subject to kosher inspectors. Not only are they subject to governing, you know, government bodies that can come in like the health department and inspect their facilities, but they are also subject to Jewish authorities that can come in and say, ah, 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 you, know, you are not doing this right, you cannot put a kosher seal on that piece of meat, you know, or something of that nature. They, for example, they can't use a wounded or diseased cow for meat. They, 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 you can't eat any pork, so nothing could be mixed with pork. They won't even mix pork and beef on a, on a, on a table. They won't even touch pork <laughs> in most cases, right? So you can be guaranteed that your food is, first of all, free from other types of foods. By the way, if you have allergies, because one of the things they won't do is mix meat, milk, and meat. So Sorry, but if you're following a kosher diet, you can't have a milkshake at McDonald's with your hamburger. <laughs> you can have a milkshake or you can have a hamburger. You can't have them together if you want to be kosher. And so in the processing of foods, they keep those things separate. So if you're lactose intolerant, you can be guaranteed if it says kosher and it says meat, it's just meat. There's no milk in it. So there are some health benefits that way. You see what I'm saying? Um, because of the rules and regulations and the inspections that they're subject to by kosher authorities, the, the food tends to be processed in cleaner facilities and more carefully. Now, that may not be true all of the time. People cheat. We realize that. They, they act one way when the inspector comes and another way when the inspector leaves, right? Uh, but if, if, they're, if they're really trying to do a good job at what they're trying to do and they want to stay in business and have a good reputation, then they have another set of governing rules and regulations that they have to follow. So in that sense, oh, for another thing, um, they can't eat any insects. So they're very careful in the preparation of foods where there could possibly be insects, now you say, oh, well, we don't have to worry about that either. I bought, uh, what's those big candy bars that kids sell all the time, the dollar bars? Um, uh, world's Finest Chocolate, somebody said it. Actually, I think Mrs. Krupski was with me. I think Ted's wife was with me. We went to an Awana training conference one time years and years ago, and I was driving. I was the only guy, and there were four ladies in my car, and we were packed in my car. It was down in Tampa, so we went down there, and we were coming. Well, while I was there, I bought some world finest chocolate to support Awana, right? A good cause. And so while we're driving, I break one open and I snap a chunk off and I'm keeping my eyes on the road. I pop it in my mouth. I'm chewing it. I pass the candy bar back, still primarily in the wrapper, but it's been open. I pass it back. And I can't remember, um, Jody Sewell was there. I'm pretty sure Jackie Krupski was there. And I, I, I don't remember who all was in the car. But the next thing I know, I hear this blood-curdling scream scared the daylights out of me, and I'm driving. Oh, oh, ah! you know, I, what, did I just kill a baby or something? What happened? I mean, that's just, ah, in the back of the car. Well, what had happened is they snapped off a piece of candy and found a cockroach completely embedded in chocolate. Now, it was dead. It was dead. It was completely dead. It was even crispy. So, I'm, I, you know, it was, I know, I ate mine. <laughs> I thought it was nuts, you know, I mean, I don't know, but, so, I don't know why, but I got to eat the whole candy bar after that, I, uh, it actually didn't taste bad, I didn't eat the rest of it, I, I wrote a letter to World's Finest Chocolate, and they sent me, in place of that, their, their apology letter and a five pound, literally a five pound chocolate bar, and, uh, Hey, that was enough for me, you know. I'm a, I'm a chocolate lover and I didn't get sick from it. So, but apparently, apparently, whoever produces it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being taped, but I, I'm sure that that doesn't happen very often. Um, but apparently something happened on one day during the processing of their candy bars where, because there was more than one embedded in the chocolate bar. And uh, now, see, if it was a kosher facility, they're very, very careful because the, the Jewish people were not allowed to eat bugs. And, and now think of that when it comes to vegetables, the processing of lettuce or vegetables that might have. And so they're very thorough 
very thorough in the cleaning process. So yes, there may be outside of nutritional value because we can't, we can't discern any, any notice, noticeable nutritional differences between eating a kosher type of diet and a non-kosher diet that would really make a difference in a person's health or lifespan. But as far as food processing, eating food processed by modern kosher methods with kosher seals could be, could be healthier for you in the sense of, of, of sanitary reasons and, and being careful to distinguish certain foods from other foods. Other than that, we really don't know scientifically whether a kosher diet, whether a diet that would consist of following the rules and regulations of Leviticus chapter 11 would be healthier for you or not. And in those days, in those days, of course, they didn't have the same methods of being clean that we have today. We're probably more careful and more clean with food than they ever were in, in past history. So if we can't prove that it's for health reasons, although, and let me make this clear, maybe it is. Maybe someday somebody will do a comprehensive study on Orthodox Jewish people who follow a strictly kosher diet and they can eliminate all of the other variables that would affect health and maybe they'll find out that they live longer or live healthier. I say eliminate the other variables because when I was in Israel, one of the things that I was shocked to see is I saw Orthodox Jews who probably follow kosher diets smoking cigarettes. They had fully automatic weapons strapped on their back. They're walking around with the completely black outfits, the black hats. They didn't cut the locks of their hair. It's hanging down. They got the long beards. They got a fully automatic weapon strapped over their back, and they're smoking cigarettes. And, you know, I just found that odd for somebody that you sort of think of as a rabbi or a man with a fully automatic weapon smoking a cigarette. It just it wasn't my idea of, you know, and, and it took me a while to get used to that. Just like we went to the Wadi Zen, Zen. Um, which is supposedly where Moses uh, struck the rock with his rod and water came out of it, went to the Wadi Zen, and uh, there was field trips. They, the, the Israeli students take field trips there, and so these buses pull in, and the teachers get off with, guess what, fully automatic weapons strapped on their back. Now here, that teacher would be surrounded by the SWAT team, tackled on the ground, and locked up in jail, because after all, guns kill people, right? Over there, the teachers are required to carry guns, not because of their students, but because of the conflict between Arabs and Israelis. And so all the teachers get off. And that was just a weird thing to see, all your teachers getting off and chaperones getting off, fully automatic weapons strapped over the back, walking around with school kids. But so you'd have to eliminate smoking from the Orthodox Jews' diet in order to determine whether or not they actually were free in their lifetime from, from more diseases than people who do not follow kosher diets. And I don't know if any study, I, I looked on the Internet, I couldn't find any study that did that kind of study. And, and so I have to agree with commentators and, and other health websites that I went to that say there's really no scientific proof. You can prove that some of these foods, without thorough cooking, without modern cooking conveniences, you know, we can, I, I can eat Chinese food that's been in the fridge for two weeks. I just stick it in the microwave and zap it, you know, and I zap it for a long time. And that microwave, I think, kills anything. Yeah. <laughs> Because I eat it, you know, my wife says, I wouldn't eat that. Well, it's okay. Zap. And, and, and you can eat it. They didn't have microwaves in ancient Israel. They didn't even have good ovens. And so they may not have been able to cook things as thoroughly, maybe in those situations. You know, we do know that pork, pork oftentimes contains uh, trichinosis eggs. You know, the, uh, it's a, a parasitic worm that you can get that bores holes into your muscles after the larvae hatch and can be very serious. They can kill you. Um... Yeah, so maybe ancient Israel would have had more problems with that because, you know, you cook food over a fire, you can cook the outside real good, but if it's a big chunk of meat, sometimes it's hard to what? Cook the inside real good. And it's the cooking process that kills some of those parasites that are found in some of it. However, beef, beef can have parasites. I hope she's not sick from me talking about parasites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beef can have parasites as well. So, again, we can't prove it's for health reasons. So if it's not, let's get to the point. What could it be for? Here's something I'm absolutely sure. Here's something I'm absolutely sure that was a part of the purpose of God giving these dietary restrictions to Israel. Why am I absolutely sure of it? Because of the text. Because of the text. Look down uh, here at Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Right in the context of all of these restrictions and prohibitions regarding things they could eat and couldn't eat, these definitions of clean and unclean, God says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. 
Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. I remember at the beginning I said, what in the world does food have to do with holiness? Well, we sometimes think of holiness as being completely free from sin. And although it encompasses that in some situations, depending on what holiness, what the context of holiness is, holiness at its root meaning primarily means separated from and separated unto. And we are separated. Ancient Israel was separated from the rest of the world unto God. They were his chosen people. He had called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldeans, and he says, you will be the father of this large nation as numerous as the stars of the the sky or the sands of the seashore and I will bless you and make your name great and I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you and on and on. He chose Israel to be a unique people unto himself. That doesn't mean God wasn't concerned with anyone else. If he wasn't concerned with anyone else he would have never sent Jonah to the nation of Nineveh to preach repentance. Nineveh was a Gentile nation. Everybody outside of the descendants of Abraham are Gentiles. God called them, though, to be a unique people unto himself, a holy, separated from the world. And the, I believe that, the, how did the, this relate to holiness? Is that every time they ate a meal, they were reminded of that. Oop, can't have that pork sandwich. I belong to God. It was, they didn't say, oh, you know, this is healthier or this is not healthier. You know, my wife does that. We go into McDonald's and she looks at the menu. That's got, oh, that's got this many calories. That's got this many calories. I can't have that, can't have that. That's fried. I don't want that. Yeah, you know, she looks at the menu and decides, now, every time they ate a meal, I can't eat this because I belong to God. I can't eat this because it was a constant reminder that they were called to be different. Every time they ate. We don't have that today. You know, we have been called. Now, the New Testament church has been called uh, to be holy. And by, by the way, I, I didn't give you the passage, but let me mention this, that, that, that where you can figure out that th these rules, these dietary restrictions were never given to the Gentiles. Listen to Deuteronomy 14, 21. It says, do not eat anything you find already dead. You may give it to an alien, alien, that is a foreigner, a Gentile, you may give it to an alien living in any of your towns, even if they lived among the Israelites. Although they were supposed to follow the civil laws that were given through Moses, apparently they didn't have to follow the dietary restrictions given to Moses. You may give it to the alien, living in any of your towns, and he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, but you are a people holy to the Lord your God. And so what it was is it was a reminder that they had been called out from God to be different. Different in every way. And I believe that the dietary restrictions were a way of constantly reminding. Did they have any health benefits? Maybe. Maybe. But that's not the primary reason for giving them. The primary reason for giving them, according to the text, was because God was holy. And he had called them out to be holy. And so he wanted them to live differently. And even when they ate, it reminded them of that. Now the Bible says you and I have been called out by God, right? We saw that last week. You and I. By the way, if you want, so there's some passages I think on your outline that would show that these dietary restrictions also don't apply to New Testament Jews. To those who come to Christ. That these, these dietary restrictions are no longer binding. In fact, none None of the ceremonial laws, none of the, the priestly rituals apply to Jewish people today because Jesus Christ is the end of that law forever and the fulfillment of it, and therefore the end of it. He is the once for all sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice of God that atoned for every sin that every person would ever commit at any time. And when we come to Christ for forgiveness, we are granted complete and total and final forgiveness. We don't have to offer sacrifices every time we sin like the Jewish people had to. And the Jewish people don't even have to do it if they accept Jesus as their once for all final sacrifice, the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for their sins. But we are said as believers to be holy. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. 1 Peter 1, verse 13 and following. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You have been called out as God's chosen people in this New Testament era. To be holy because God is holy. To be separate from the world and from your evil desires, the desires of your flesh. To live holy unto God. You belong to him, not to yourself. If you know Jesus, you belong to him. 
And therefore, life is all about him and what he wants, not about me and what I want. But a lot of Christians are still struggling with that. Most of us are, right? I am struggling with that from time to time. I still want to do what I want to do, and sometimes I don't want to do what God wants me to do. And there's a battle that takes place in the flesh. And at those times, it's a very good time, a a very good time to remember, I don't belong to myself. I belong to him. I belong to him. And I'm not here to do my will. I'm here, as Jesus prayed, to do his will. I'm not here to seek after the things that I want, but to seek after the things that he wants. I'm to be holy because God is holy. Israel was to be holy because God was holy. And every time they ate a meal, they were reminded of that. So what reminds us? Our, our diets don't. Our shapes don't. <laughs> right? What reminds us that we belong to the Lord? The Holy Spirit of God who indwells each and every one of you that knows Christ as your Savior. And he reminds you that you belong to God, that you belong to God. He convicts us of our sins and reminds us that you belong to God. He convicts us of righteousness and reminds us you belong to God. Are you giving in to the Holy Spirit or are you giving in to the flesh? Are you quenching the Spirit or are you trying to quench the flesh. You belong to God. Let's pray. <clears throat> With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus was the Lamb of God, planned from before the foundation of the world to be the once for all final sacrifice for the sins of people. He was the infinite God-man who took on flesh, God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, He lived a perfect life. He did miracles, defying natural explanation and nature itself so that people would know he was who he claimed to be, even rising from the dead to to solidify that in the minds of those who saw him. He died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead. But the forgiveness of sins is not automatic. The forgiveness of sin only comes through faith through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, if the Holy Spirit is convicting you of your need for salvation, if you realize that I am a sinner and I need forgiveness and I need salvation, then right now, why don't you just call out to Jesus for that salvation? Believe on Him. And maybe express it with a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me And right now, the best I know how, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me of all my unrighteous acts, to make me your child, to give me eternal life. I know I don't deserve it, and I know I can't earn it, and so I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus and what he did for me. This morning, if that was the prayer of your heart, would you just lift your hand and wave at me for just a second? Just just lift your hand and wave at me. And I want to remember you in my prayers, okay? Anyone else? Praise the Lord. Anybody else? If you are a believer, do you live life with the realization that you have been called to be holy, that you have been separated from the world unto God for His purposes, for His will, for His desires? Father in heaven, although we don't have meals that remind us of that each and every day of our lives, we have your Holy Spirit who indwells us. And we are aware of his convicting power when we do wrong. And we are also aware of it when we do right. And so, Father, help us to give in to your word and to your spirit as he guides and directs us to live lives holy, holy, not just partially. Help us not to be on the fence walking in the world and walking in the ways of God, but to be totally dedicated to the purposes of God as we go through life, no matter what we do for a living. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I hope to see you in Sunday school and tonight for the movie, God's Not Dead, verse 1. Be holy because our God is holy.